victory in Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand for opening prayer, please. Lord God of heaven and earth, we praise you and bless you this evening, Father. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in your house again tonight, Lord God. And we just invite your Holy Spirit. Come, living, come, Holy Spirit of the living God. Come tonight. Move among your people. We look with hope and expectancy of your move in our lives tonight. And we're going to give you all the praise and all the glory in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Brother McCoy is going to come forward and lead us in some hymns. All right, it's been requested, page 607. Just a closer walk with thee. Amen. Is that your heart's desire? We, yes. It ought to be what's taking place in each and every one of our hearts here in camp meeting. Draw nearer to God, closer to God. All right. Oh. Uh -huh. 
I'm glad we can do that. Amen. Just a closer walk with him. Amen. Let it be. Amen. While we stand together, if you're able. Amen. Page 444. Hallelujah. Universal language. Hallelujah. I am free. Are you free tonight? Find their page, sorry, Dave. 444. You can't understand this, Kentuckian? <laughs> 444. Okay, Brother Dave. singing tonight. Well, we want to go to prayer. We always have lots to pray for, especially during uh, camp season. We want to lift up the, the men that have been at the altar this week, continue to have the Lord woo them, and to have others too tonight maybe come to the altar, Lord.
So we want to pray for um, Reverend Plank tonight as he brings the message. I want to continue to pray for the McCoys as they bring us all the wonderful singing and song. I want to pray for Brother and Sister Ledger. I want to pray for the cooks. We thank the cooks. We're grateful to them. We're having great meals. I want to pray for uh, Brother Wooten. He spent the night in Chattanooga tonight. It's bad weather up there, and he's going to get up and go all the way to Kentucky to again tomorrow. And so let's keep him in prayer Amen. while he's gone. Does anybody have a prayer request tonight? Find out you don't have to have other people there, right? Want to continue to you see why they, they, they should have been here at 3.30? <laughs> want to continue to pray for Reverend Jerome McFarland and all he has to do? to pray for the Ukraine. Yes. yes. For the Lord to protect those people yes. there. Help them. I, Will? I feel that it's in the plan of my Lord. Okay. Okay. I feel a lot better that it will have to get into that plan. Prayer works. Want to pray for unsaved loved ones? Yeah. Anybody else? Sister Black? Henry? All right, who else would like prayer? I know I would tonight. Let's stand for prayer. Brother Fred Sauber, would you lead us in prayer, please? Our loving Father, we're glad we can call thee our Heavenly Father. Yes, yes Lord. We know that we that have been born of the Spirit of God, yes, we're Jesus. your children. And you know yes, what we Lord. have need of. You take care of us even before we call yes, the name. Jesus, thank you. You're already answering because yes, you know Lord. what our needs are. Thank you for it all, what you're doing. Yes, we thank you for every man. 
boys are going to come and bless us with some music. Bless us and help us. A lot of songs we get, we get them from somebody else. And sometimes my husband says, honey, I don't know if that's saying it. So we don't want to copy the way we sing it. In case he had it wrong. Now me, if I liked it, I'd just do it the way they did. <laughs> but anyway, um, we sung this in Salisbury, North Carolina, at a meeting. And uh, and I, I heard that somebody else sing this uh, the other verse. And, and I go, oh, yeah, there's another verse to that. But the lady just, she said, I know the author of this. And so the next night she brought me the sheet music to it. And this verse is not there, okay? I'm not even sure where we got it. And I like the other verse just fine. And those that know the song and know the other verse, it's not that we don't know it, but I just prefer this verse because it's personal. I never dreamed there was a power that could save a wretch like me. The king and the beggar, not a one of us deserve it. Not a one of us. But I'm glad. I'm thankful that we can all be a part of it.
beautiful song. What truth. All right. It's time to take the offering. We're going to have a couple ushers come forward, and this goes towards the expenses of the mission. Father, for uh, supplying all of our needs according to your riches and glory, Father. Oh, yeah. I thank you for everything that you do yeah. for us, Father. You give us, you give us more than what we need, Father. Oh, and all you Lord. expect back is as an offering, only a sin, <coughs> Father. So, Father, I give you all of me, Father, and all of us, Father. I pray, Lord, that you will, the that, that the, the tithes and the offerings that you receive, Father, oh, that it will, that it will honor you, Lord. I yes, pray, Lord. Father, that it will accomplish Amen. what it set out to Amen. accomplish, that it will save souls, that it will lead people to Christ, Father, Praise and most of all, to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all for your giving, and thank you all for the beautiful offertory. Amen. All right, the McCoys are come, coming forward and lead us in another song. They're going to have a special song. And then, after that, 
Brother Plank's going to bring us a message. I hadn't planned on saying this, but that song, Life's a Big Blue, it's a flying spinoff, but uh, there's knees, I'm sitting up here and there's knees, so some knees anybody can take care of for you, you know, but those big knees, brother, those big knees, come on, you can take care of I'm glad for those applying that deep need to Amen. my heart. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. So thankful. I'm glad for his grace tonight. Yo. 
praise God. Thanks again for ministering to our hearts in a beautiful song. I'll tell you one thing. We have had tremendous Bible studies here in the morning. I said uh, it's been beefsteak, beefsteak in the morning. And then the music, the music, the instruments. I sat here thinking, how many strings did it take to make that beautiful harmony and melody of this piano and that guitar in that offertory? And I have the privilege of sitting right here where when David's playing this, almost seems to me sometimes it almost vibrates my chair. I kind of like it. I don't even have to put a quarter in it, anything. <laughs> I just, I just, I just kind of like it, and of course, you know how I love that guitar, but uh, the only thing is, that tonight was so beautiful, it almost put me to sleep. <laughs> I closed my eyes, and I thought, oh, if I could take this with me to my room tonight, I'd play it over and over and over, praise God. Oh, thank you for ministering to us in music. And, and then, of course, that song, Coy McGinnis, somehow, somehow realized that awesome truth. Oh, God. What do we need worse than your grace? And then to be convinced that all you need for us to have it is the man. I'll be honest with you, I just somehow believe that it's within the capabilities of every person here, if we choose to do it, we can give up and give over uh, the man or the woman. We can, we can give ourselves to God. And, uh, and what, what wonder we receive in, in, in doing that to receive his grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Hallelujah. Oh, that song, bless my heart. Bless my heart this evening. You know, something else that blesses my heart is, is I've, uh, I've told you, you you have inspired me. I've I've watched you coming in and and singing and worshiping and and even giving. I mean, I look at you what's well when you're giving. I mean, some of you don't look like you're enjoying that, but <laughs> but most of you do, and just that you do all those things. But you know, very few places do I get into anymore where every single row, every bench in the place has somebody on it. <coughs> but night after night at Fort Myers, every single, including back into these little annexes, everything except that back one where, where that's pushed up against the wall and the other one in front of it's right up to it. So you'd have anybody bigger than Cliff Sarver couldn't even get in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but other than that, every row has, has somebody in it. I'm not saying every row is absolutely full, but every row has somebody in it. And boy, that just inspires my heart. Well, it's, it's a scripture that's probably known by more people than perhaps any other single verse of scripture in Holy Writ. And of course, that's John 3.16. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then there was a while back, and not so long ago either, that I was reading that chapter where that verse is, John chapter 3, 
And it all of a sudden dawned on me, Brother McCoy, that in that chapter, he tells us how that verse can be applicable to every one of us. He tells us how to do it. He tells us what's got to be done that we can realize that the love of God the Father that gave us Christmas, but gave us Christmas with an eye to Calvary. And at Calvary, which we have been hearing every morning in the Bible study, at Calvary, God provided everything that we need for our soul's redemption, that we can go to heaven, that we can have hope to go to heaven, that John 3.16 could be a personal reality for us, you know. And uh, I got to reading this, and he said there's three things that have to happen. They're not arbitrary. They're not choose one of the three. But in this third chapter of John, surrounding that verse, there's three things that have to happen. They're, they're rather simplistic, and yet, and yet, Sister McCoy, you're right. I... When you said that to me, I thought, right on. They're simplistic, but they're deep. Yes. Yes. They're deep. They're so deep that we can't do a thing about any of them without the help of God. But John 3.16 assures us of the help of God if we realize these three things. I just want to simply share them with you tonight. I think they're things you know, but we'll just be reminded. The first one is, ye must be, ye must be born again. Every man and woman, every boy and girl, you must be born again. God divested heaven's best in the Christ, Jesus left the splendor of glory, the splendor of heaven, to come down here and walk amongst men. And we've been learning in the Bible studies this, in the mornings of what we did to him when he did that. And yet John 3.16 was so in the mind of God, so in the heart of God, that he would give his only begotten, his son, in our stead. But it was Jesus who said to, the, uh, to Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, except a man be born again, in verse 3, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, if you or I had been the first one to really hear that, if we had an inclination toward God, if we, if we had a, a desire to, to question the Christ ourself and realize that like we've been told, no man speaks like this man. And, and then he look at us and say, I say unto you, ye must be born again. And it rocked Nicodemus kind of back on his heels. The impossibility of it. The absurdity of it. To, to be faced by the master, you've got to be born again. The impossibility of that. It behooves us to recognize when Jesus tells you to do something, it's doable. And when Jesus tells you to do something, it's necessary that we do it. 
But when Jesus tells you to do something, indeed if you will obey, he will enable you to do the seemingly impossible. And seeing that it rocked Nicodemus back on his heels, Jesus said, Verily, verily, verse 5, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And then to a learned man, Jesus explains uh, with simplicity and yet very deeply, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And so he's telling us, that the birth that he's talking about, the new birth that he's talking about, ye must be born again, is not a second physical birth, obviously. It's a spiritual birth. And it's none other than Jesus himself that says that you and I have got to have, yes, a physical birth, obviously. I would suppose every one of you have, in fact, been born. Uh, I mean, a couple of you look like, well, I won't go there. I was. You know, that's not funny. Uh, yeah, good observation. Like I said, I have a degree. Step into the front now to prove it. <laughs> I know, I, but I really don't remember much about it. To tell you the truth, I, I was told I was born uh, in September, get this, September the 28th, 1947 A.D. <laughs> A.D. I don't know what some of you guys are on, but we're <laughs> glad you're here, I'll tell you that. I don't know much about it, but I do know that I was told about it, and, and I was told that my folks were, were expecting me, and they were excited about it, and when I did finally come, uh, of course, born in a, I was, actually, actually tonight yet, I'm in the process of selling it, but I inherited part of the family farm, and I own the house that I was born in. Isn't that neat? I mean, that's nothing to brag about, but I do. I, if I'd have known I was going to own it, I'd have fixed it up better before I was born, but <laughs> I didn't know it. But uh, I, I was told that I, I come, and Dad went out on the porch and hollered across the creek and over the, over the other side of the uh, valley there to Artie Boyce and, and hollered out, It's a boy! Well, I'm glad I was born in an era when they could tell. <laughs> I mean, I'm just telling you right now, we're living it today. Who would have ever thunk it? <laughs> thunk is Greek word meaning given it any, any consideration. Who would have ever thought it? Well, I don't want to stay there. But I'm just saying... People take note when you're born. And boy, your life, say what you want to, it, it, it all goes back to that, that you remember it, and you remember how many years it was, and therefore we determine how ancient some of you are because of your birthday. Jesus said in the third chapter of John, you must be born again. Oh, God. Help us, help us, you must be born again. But because it's here 
And because it's in the Bible, and because Jesus says it, I would just simply remind you that it's an absolute necessity, but it's a total possibility. Say what you want to. You can know that you are born again as surely as you know that you were born back then. You can know that. I like, I like over in Thessalonians, uh, I sometimes read that and, and remember how the Apostle Paul in chapter 1 of Thessalonians reminds them as he's speaking to them and writing to them in, in that book of the Bible, he said, remember our gospel came unto you uh, not in word only. It did, though, come in word. The gospel came. And the gospel comes to us and wherever it finds us in the blackness and darkness of sin, light begins to shine. The entrance of thy word giveth light. And so he said, the gospel came unto you in word. God speaks to us. God invites us. But he said it came not only in word, but it came in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Thessalonians in power. There's power in the word of God. It, it's the power of God to get our attention. It's the power of God to, to make us hungry uh, for God. It's the power of God that helps us, enables us to make rational choice. I'm going to choose to go God's way. I'm going to choose to wave goodbye to the old life of sin. I'm going to forsake the old habits of sin. I can't break them. I had no hope in them. But Jesus come and the light of the gospel gives me hope. Gives me hope. Hallelujah. That I can be different. And when you and I come to him in repentance. In repentance. When Jesus began to preach, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. And when you and I repent, and again, that's in Matthew chapter 4, but again, what I like about that is that it's, it's a requirement that's easily reached and available to every man. Everybody here can repent. If you want to, you can repent. Nobody can stop you. Nobody can keep you from doing it. It's, it's the easiest thing, and yet it's the most difficult thing to admit that we're wrong, to confess that we're wrong, confess that we're needy, confess that we're helpless. But if we'll do that, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Hallelujah. And when you confess your sins, then the result is the Holy Ghost comes and the power of the blood is applied and you and I are born again. Hallelujah. It's a birth that, that we knew nothing about when we were born and dated back there. But thank God, God comes in a place like this, in a time like this, for a people like this, he comes that you and I can have a second birth, a spiritual birth, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. Ye must be born again. Hallelujah. The second thing in the third chapter of John that we read, for God so loved the world, is the fact that the Son of Man must be lifted up in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's one thing for you and I to realize that we're not where we ought to be. We're not what we ought to be. We must be born again. And it's a happy day when an individual begins to realize and becomes convinced and then begins to admit, I indeed need 
what Jesus is talking about. I need a difference. I need a remedy. I need a change. I need a helper. And so when we begin to realize that, but realizing that is one thing, doing anything about it is another thing. I, by taking thought, can't work out my own salvation. I can't, by flexing a muscle, power my way into a new birth. I can't, by great exercise or strenuous uh, endeavor, uh, produce a new birth within myself. I can't do it, and God knew that. That's why John 3.16 is here. God knew that. And so God gave us the ability to go through that because he knew that you and I were powerless and you and I were weak and you and I couldn't change ourselves. And so he gave us Christmas to point to a cross that you and I could look to the cross that Brother Hanfield has been talking about. And the cross is powerful to loom up before us and overshadow us and give us a hope that heretofore eluded us. He said it's like Moses in the wilderness. And if we'd go back there, you'd read in the Old Testament, long before John chapter 3, that as they were out, as the children of Israel were journeying from Mount Hor back in chapter 21 of Numbers, it says as they went, the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And because of that, they began to complain and they spake against God and they spake against Moses. And it says the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of, of Israel died because of their grumbling, because of their disobedience. Because they were discouraged with the way. They didn't want to take the way that God was leading them. And sometimes, sadly, sometimes that's the way we're living. We might not say it, we may not speak it, but we're living in a way that displeases God. We're living in a way we know He's not favored. We're living in a way that's contrary to the will of God for our life, and we know it and we don't do anything about it, and we complain in it. We complain against God. We complain against His servants. When it happened in the Old Testament, God sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and they began to die. And then the people woke up and said, cried out, We have sinned. We have sinned. Moses was discouraged with them too because I was reading that this afternoon and, and just before this, this, this rec, uh, record uh, in, in, in Numbers chapter 21, it records the death of Miriam and, and then the death of Aaron, which was the brother and the sister of Moses. He'd had two funerals. He'd lost two people that were older than he and had, had been such a support for him as he led the people of God through most of the journey, they're gone now. Now the people are rising up and they're complaining uh, against God and against him. And now the serpents come in. But Moses prays for the people. No matter how bad it is, no matter where we're at, no matter the measure of rebellion, thank God, thank God there are people that care about us. Thank God there's somebody praying for us. Thank God there's somebody that cares. I don't understand it. We didn't deserve it. But there was somebody that perhaps we didn't even, weren't even aware of it was whispering our name in the wee hours of the morning because they cared and Moses prayed. And God back there advised him, told him, take a, 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 a brazen serpent, a, a, a figure of what is hurting them, take it and lift it up, 
And if the people are bitten by a, a, a real serpent and they'll cast their eyes to that. It wasn't a call to worship an idol, but it was a type of looking to a Savior. It was an Old Testament type of looking to one that, that would die on an old rugged cross and in the midst of your dilemma, in the midst of your dying, if you'll cast a wistful glance to the old rugged cross, the power of the cross and the flow of blood therefrom can be your redemption. You must be born again. But he says the way you can be is that he must be lifted up. And there's a real sense where we realize, of course, he was lifted up. Accusation was made. Abuse was directed to him. And, and as a lamb before its shears is dumb, he went to an old rugged cross in our stead. And we were gleeful about it, and we mocked him. And if we'd have been there, we'd have probably joined the crowd. And they even taunted and said, if you be the Christ, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. And the songwriter said he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have spoke the word. He didn't need an angel. He could have spoke the word. He could have come down. But a songwriter said, really, no, he couldn't. He couldn't because of John 3.16. He had to be lifted up on that old cross because of the 16th verse in that chapter. He had to be our Savior. And the songwriter said, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And if we could only see it tonight, people, that's what Sister McCoy said up there earlier in the service. That's deep. That's deep that God would have you on his mind when he's on the cross. That's a simple reminder tonight from John chapter 3 that he still has you on his mind and he has you in his heart even while he was lifted up in suffering on an old rugged cross. You must be born again, but this second must is that he must be lifted up. But if he be lifted up, then it enables you to be born again. He becomes your sacrifice. His, his blood becomes your plea. It's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. And then as, as you and I avail ourselves to be born again, as we seek him and say, yes, Lord, I, I confess, I repent, I my, I have no other plea but, but the cross, the blood, the Savior. And then the third thing in, in closing tonight is the fact that on down, the first two are about Jesus, and the other is as well, but it's actually the words of John the Baptist when John, on down in the third chapter, uh, verse, verse uh, number uh, 30, says, looking at Jesus, he must increase, uh, I must decrease. I hope I'm not reading too much in the scripture, but heretofore in ministry, John had been the flaming evangel. John had been the herald of Christ. John had been the forerunner of Christ. John was a mysterious man. He, he come out of the, uh, of the shadows and and it's like he had the thumb of God in his back, and without fear and without favor, he cried out, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and people came and were converted and baptized, and John was a mighty preacher, and then Christ came, and this message in Matthew chapter 4 was the same, repent. Jesus preached the same message, and people began to follow Jesus, and some were following John, 
and as a result of that, early on in Jesus' ministry, John recognized, I must decrease, he must increase. I want to tell you what he's saying there is a reminder to us tonight, one of the most difficult things there is to do for any man or woman is to decrease. It goes against, almost goes against what God has put in us to the survival of the fittest, you know, the idea that you, you try to react in a way to protect yourself and go forward and better yourself. But John said, I've got to diminish. I've got to decrease. Christ has got to increase. And I would remind you that while it may not be exactly intended there, it is in fact what takes place when you and I are born again. Because of Calvary, Christ be lifted up on Calvary. Christ be lifted up in our lives. He becomes the centerpiece of our life. And we, we diminish. It doesn't mean that we hurt ourselves or cut ourselves or do things to our bodies physically. But it does mean that we step not just back, we step out to see Christ manifest. And if holiness does anything in our lives, it magnifies Christ. It promotes Christ. It decreases until self be slain and they see only you. It's, it's a hard thing to do. Nobody likes to lose. And, and to decrease seems like you're losing. But to decrease in the great presence of the Christ, you're gaining. Everything you give up, everything you surrender, everything you submit to Christ becomes an enablement for you to walk through this old life stepping toward eternity in absolute victory. And the disciples later on following Calvary would be admonished to tarry. Tarry until you be endued with power from on high. We could look into the book of Acts chapter 2 and see that when they were all gathered together and the Holy Ghost came, the Bible said he came and filled their hearts with his presence. Tell me how much of self can remain and you be considered full of the Holy Ghost. When he comes and fills your heart, you are emptied of self. That doesn't mean you no longer are you. You're going to have the same intellect. When God sanctifies you, you're not going to be Superman. I mean, not that Superman had an intellect. He had a good thing going, though. I've, oh, I've so wanted to jump in a phone booth, put my blue leotards on, and come out and fly. I, I tried it once. Not in a phone booth. I climbed up on the chicken coop roof. I didn't have blue leotards on either. I had blue jeans. That's as close as I desired to come <laughs> to him. I had a bath towel around me, I mean my neck, for a cape. And I stood there over the chickens. And I knew that Superman always dove. So I built up my courage, but then... The only thing that deterred me, we had a big old hickory tree out in the chicken yard and had a branch that come unusually low 
from that vantage point from the roof. And I knew when I dove out and started to fly that I was going to have to dip under that and then come back up. And I wasn't sure I could do it, so I chickened out. I chickened out. But when you decrease, when you decrease, you're still going to be you, but you're still going to look like you look pretty much. Although there's some of us could use a little help. <laughs> and not from who you're thinking of either. <laughs> I'm just saying John, John looked at Jesus. And John sincerely said, I will become nothing that he would become everything. And so, in the chapter where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he's reminding us on this Tuesday night, you basically, it's, it's for you and it starts with you've got to be born again. But you can be. And men and, and ladies, when you are, it'll change you entirely. I mean, as far as spiritually, it will change you entirely. It'll spoil you of this old world when you begin to go with God. There's no comparison. And the hope you've got is that he be lifted up. There's a cross, and you can look to it. And he's lifted up within us, that as we walk in the light, we delight in him. His people become our people. His place becomes our place. His grace when we give him the man becomes our sufficiency. And when we are his, he increases, we decrease until there comes a place where by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit within our heart by faith, he can purify our heart, meaning he can cleanse us of all the carnal self. And Christ sits enthroned within our heart. Praise God. It doesn't make us ridiculous. It doesn't make us fanatical. It just makes us clean and ready for heaven. It takes care of our vocabulary. It takes care of our appearance. It takes care of our ambitions. It takes care of our affections. And really, it takes care of our association. It, it just takes over our entire life. And what a change. The McCoys have been singing about it all camp. We've been singing about it in the congregational song. Brother Hanfield's been teaching us about it about it. And I've been trying to preach about it a little bit, but it's real. It's real tonight. Praise God. That's kind of a simple message this evening, but that's what I felt on my heart. I've delivered it to you. I'm ready for you to stand up. And again, tonight, I, I'm not going to pull it all. In fact, it kind of felt like maybe not even to have an altar call tonight, and yet it's camp meeting. It's Tuesday night. It's the only Tuesday night of camp we're going to have. So if there is somebody that we've been praying for you, maybe you raised your hand. Maybe somebody you're not yet where you ought to be, not yet where you want to be. Altars open if you need to pray before we go. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Altars open if you need to pray. Otherwise, we're not going to quit praying. We're going to keep trusting God. We got a lot of good camp left yet.
Let's trust him to help us. Father in heaven, go with us tonight. Keep your hand upon us, I pray. Bless the men. Bless the ladies that are here. Help us to meditate upon your word. It's simplicity, but as our sister has said, it, it's, it's deep when we begin to think about it. We need your help, Lord, to, to go with it. We pray you'll help us to go with it. We pray that you'll speak to us through it and help us to obey you and give us a great continuing of the camp. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Shake hands with somebody you like. And